I have brought this debate to the House tonight to urge the Government to announce the results of its review into how the benefits system treats the terminally ill. The review was announced over 19 months ago now, on the 11th of July 2019, in response to campaigning by charities Marie Curie, the Motor Neurone Disease Association and others. And I want to pay tribute to those charities for all their work on this issue and their support to me in bringing forward my Welfare Terminal Illness 10-Minute Rule Bill last summer. And thank also those individual campaigners like Mark Hughes, David Dave Setters and so many others who have continued to make a compelling case for change. The same is true of my friend Madeleine Moon, the former MP for Bridge End, who did so much good work on this issue during her time as chair of the all-party group on motor neurone disease. She had first-hand experience of the mental and emotional toil that comes with supporting a loved one with terminal illness, and the bill she brought to the House on this issue in 2018 is the inspiration for this bill I brought forward last summer. I have no doubt that the pressure exerted by the, these and other extraordinary individuals and organisations was instrumental in pushing the Government into announcing the review in July 2019. So on their behalf, I again call on the Government today to take urgent action on two elements of the Special Rules for Terminal Illness Guidelines that are not fit for purpose. They are the six-month rule, which means someone is obliged to provide medical proof they have six months or less to live so that they can access benefits quickly, more sensitively and at a higher rate and the three-year award, which forces terminally ill people to reapply for benefits in the minority of cases where they're lucky enough to live longer than three years after the benefit is awarded. The special rules for terminal illness process is intended to enable people who are terminally ill to access benefits such as personal independence payment or universal credit rapidly at the highest level of payment without going through the standard application process. A claim under the special rules requires a person's doctor, consultant or specialist nurse to submit a DS1500 form stating that the person is reasonably likely to die within six months. That forces people who have unpredictable terminal illnesses such as motor neurone disease or those expected to live longer than six months to apply via the standard claims process which involves filling in long forms, attending assessments, delays in payment, lower rates and even meeting work coaches, all while waiting months for payments. Clearly that is a highly inappropriate for people who have been given the devastating news that their condition is terminal. The six-month six rule is flawed and urgently needs to change. The All-Party Group for Terminal Illness, chaired by the member for Inverness, Nairn, Badenoch and Strass Bay, found in its 2019 report that it was outdated and arbitrary with no basis in clinical reality. This six-month hard deadline is too much to ask of carers and claimants. It creates a completely understandable resistance to applying, prompting the added pain of writing down the grim reality of daily life and the inevitable future darkness. It gives no hope, no joy in life in a world where hope and joy are often all that can keep you going. And in the case of unpredictable illnesses like MND, heart and lung failure and many neurological conditions, it's all but impossible for clinicians to make an accurate prediction of life expectancy. It's little wonder that nearly a third of clinicians told the all-party group that they've never signed a DS1500 form for a patient with a non-cancer condition. That means patients like Simon, who was diagnosed with MND in December 2020, aren't able to access the special rules. His wife Nicola told the MND Association the doctor said that the DS1500 was designed for cancer patients. He looked at Simon and said, you won't be dead in six months. We had to complete the whole form and apply under the standard rules. It's so long-winded, so time-consuming, because you just don't think about how long you spend on helping him get dressed, etc. People need that support. Often it feels like you're just banging your head against the wall. This same unpredictability is why the three-year award also needs to change. Half of all people with motor neurone disease, for example, die within two years of being diagnosed, while only around 10% live for more than five years. But there's no reliable way for doctors to determine who that 10% will be, 
and like many progressive illnesses, their condition has no prospect of improvement and will only deteriorate further as time goes on. Emma Saisal from the wonderful St David's Hospice in Newport tells me they're seeing more and more cases of cancer patients having to reapply for benefits with the DS1500 after three years. This comes in part due to improvements that are being made in palliative treatments, but while patients are living longer, they are still living with a terminal illness. One particular example they presented to me was of a lady in her mid-40s diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. This lady's prognosis at diagnosis was very poor and she had two teenage children. It was quite right to submit the DS1500 at diagnosis. Her disease is still progressing, but due to the palliative chemotherapy she's received, this process has been slowed and therefore she's now lived longer than three years. She has recently had to reapply for all her benefits again due to the three-year rule, which has been hugely stressful for her and her family. And it is a clear anomaly that terminally ill people are only awarded benefits for three years. Employment and support allowance groups claimants with progressive conditions are entitled to the severe conditions exemption, meaning they don't have to repeat work capability assessments, while higher rate PIP claimants can qualify for an ongoing award with a light touch review at the end of a 10 year point. It is cruel and absurd that people who are living with a lifelong condition are entitled to a 10 year or lifetime award, while those with terminal illnesses have been told they must reapply for benefits or risk losing them after just three years. Those who do happen to live longer than three years tell me they feel they're being punished by the system for living too long. It's now seven months to the day since I presented my 10 minute rule bill on this, and more than 19 months since the then Secretary of State, Amber Rudd, announced a review of how the benefits system treats terminally ill people. In all of that time, we've had no official word from the government on when it intends to bring forward these vital and long awaited changes to the benefits system. I will give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way, and I, I commend her for, for the campaigning work that she's doing on this. Uh, for an extended period and, and following the work that um, Madeleine Moon was doing. But does she agree with me? I mean, it was back in 2018 that Scotland introduced their changes to SRTI. It seems very late that the, 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 the government here has not done anything about it. And this is all about funding people who desperately need money at that particular stage in the last few months of their lives. And I thank my honourable friend um, for that contribution and he, uh, my honourable friend reads my mind for I'm <laughs> just about to come on to that section to say that this is an issue across the whole UK and while the devolved, but while the devolved governments of Scotland and Northern Ireland appear to be treating this issue as a higher priority than the UK government, the Scottish government passed law to change the six months rule for devolved benefits back in 2018 which will be coming into force later this year. The Northern Ireland Assembly unanimously backed a motion to scrap it in October and the executive there is actively proactively looking to fix this issue and deliver reform quickly. Why then is Westminster dragging its heels? When I introduced my bill last July, the Minister for Disabled People, Welfare and Work indicated that change would be coming shortly and later confirmed in the House on the 19th of October last year that the government will be changing the six-month rule following its review. But all this time later, we are still waiting to hear exactly what it will be changed to and when this change will be introduced. If ministers have made up their minds that change is needed, why is there any need for any further delay? Why the long silence? Every day the government postpones an announcement on the outcome of its review, more people are diagnosed with a terminal illness and risk being unable to fast track, get fast track support from a benefit system if they cannot prove they have less than six months to live. People who will face exactly the kind of inappropriate medical and work capability assessment that the special rules for terminal illness are supposed to exempt them from before they can access the support they need. People who will also face huge delays in getting payments. The average wait for a first PIP payment is now 16 weeks, at a time when their illness may mean they cannot work and have no other money coming in. People like Alan, who has terminal pulmonary fibrosis and told Marie Curie, when I was diagnosed, I was told I would have five years life expectancy as an average. Day to day it affects everything I do. I can't get dressed by myself, I can't go to the shop by myself, I get very breathless doing anything. When I first applied for PIP, they were very dismissive. One of the things they did was because I walked from a lift to a room, which was about 10 steps, 
On that basis, they judged I could walk 200 yards. Because I was refused PIP, I couldn't get hold of other things like a parking card or a discount for train travel, so I was in receipt of no benefits at all, although I do have a terminal illness which gets worse month to month, year to year. For some, that delay will mean they die without receiving any support at all. Between April 2018 and October 2019, 2,140 people applying for PIP, which is only one of the benefits affected by this rule, had their claim turned down under the normal rules, only to die within six months of making their claim. Many of them will have been terminally ill people, unable to claim via the special rules because they couldn't prove they had six months to live. Even when the DWP does accept a claim, it often comes too late. According to the DWP's own figures, an average of 10 people die every day while waiting for a decision on their PIP claim. End of Life charity Marie Curie estimates that this means that more than 5,900 people have died waiting for a decision since the DWP announced its review. That's nearly 6,000 families who have been put through the needless distress and anguish, with more facing it every day because of a rule the government has already admitted needs to change. Families like Michelle, her mum died aged 62 in 2018. She was initially awarded zero points for PIP and she was told she was capable of working. She was hooked to a feeding tube 16 hours a day, seven days a week, weighed 32 kilograms when she died. Several illnesses include, had several illnesses including Crohn's, osteoporosis and terminal lung cancer. And yet she was awarded nothing. Michelle took her mum's case to a tribunal, but by the time the decision came back, her mother, that her mother should be awarded maximum points for PIP, she had died. Michelle says, this should have been money that my mum had to make her final days better. It should never have gone as far as a tribunal. Dying people deserve to be treated with dignity by the benefits system. Nobody knows when they're given the devastating news that their illness is terminal, how long they have left. Not their loved ones, not their doctor, and not a DWP benefits assessor. However much time they have left should be spent living as well as they can for as long as they can, making memories with long ones. It should not be spent worrying about money, filling in endless forms, being dragged to assessments and fighting for the support they need. As Madeleine Moon said back in 2018, the unknown time you have must not be spent worrying about accessing benefits or keeping a roof over your head. It must be spent in love, laughter and taking the painful journey together with dignity and compassion. People living with terminal illness and their loved ones have been campaigning tirelessly for change for more than two years. Many of them will not have lived to see the change they've fought for. An end to the six month and three year rules and a change to the system to allow anyone who has received the devastating news from a clinician that they are terminally ill to get fast tracked access to benefits via the special rules. That's the clinician's judgment should be evidence enough. We all understand there have been unforeseen circumstances with COVID-19 since the government announced its review, but people don't have time to wait further. For the last 19 months, they've been waiting in a frustrating limbo, told that change is coming, but with no announcement in sight from ministers. They and the charities that are campaigning on their behalf are understandably impatient with 19 months of warm words from the government and promises that change are always coming soon. For many, soon is already too late, and with each day that passes, soon will be too late for many more. I urge ministers to do better than soon. Can the minister give us a date today when they'll be publishing the outcome of the DWP review, give the campaigners who have called for change some clarity, and give us a timeline setting out when the government will make changes to the law, which, have, which they've already accepted and needed without further delay? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I would, uh, first of all, like to pay tribute to the Honourable Member for Newport East. There's very little in her powerful and constructive speech that I can disagree with. And she demonstrated this earlier with her private member's bill, which would have potentially had a, a second hearing, but for the suspension of the Friday sittings recently. So I very much welcome that she's had an opportunity to set out the case of her, her former colleague, Madeleine Moon, who was formidable uh, in the meetings, drawing from our own personal experiences and helping shape and focus our work as we went forward. And this is an issue that has much interest, Mr Deputy Speaker, from cross-party MPs, uh, not just here in Parliament, but across the UK in the devolved assemblies, health and disability charities and stakeholder groups, 
public, uh, public advocates such as Charlotte Hawkins uh, on behalf as a patron of MND, individual campaigners up and down the country, including Mark Hughes, Liam uh, Dwyer and Sandra Smith, who've brought the campaign right here into Westminster and spoken to myself and the Honourable Member for Newport East. And I absolutely, as does the Department, understand the importance of this issue and the need to make changes. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is focused around special rules terminal illness, SRTI. And for an individual, their friends and families receiving a terminal diagnosis is devastating. Supporting people in this difficult situation is crucial. And SAR, SRTI ensures financial support can be provided as quickly as possible so the claimant can focus on what time they have remaining. And on the basis of this, and this being raised by that extensive list of interested MPs, stakeholders and campaigners, we rightly agreed to do a full and comprehensive review of the support that we offer that focused on four strands. Firstly, hearing directly from claimants and charities about their first-hand experiences. We had claimant engagement, including drop-in sessions and conversations with claimants with cancer and motor neuron disease. We also held extensive stakeholder workshops and meetings with organisations, including the Motor Neuron Disease Association, Macmillan, Marie Curie, MSA Trust, Sue Ryder, National Bereavement Alliance, Hospice UK, National Nurse Consultants Group, the Association of Palliative Care Social Workers, British Lung Foundation, Queen's Nursing Institute, Association for Palliative Medicine, Royal College of Physicians and the British Geriatric Society, amongst others. And I wish to thank them for the huge amounts of time and resources they dedicated to help making sure that as we bring forward changes, they are the right changes that work. Secondly, we looked at international evidence to find out what works in other nations and the support that they provide. And uh, this included looking at 22 separate countries. Thirdly, we reviewed the current DWP performance to better understand how our SRTI rules and severe condition processes operate and perform, including looking at the DS1500, a full audit, an in-house staff research and a clinician survey which had over a thousand clinicians taking the time to complete and give us helpful advice and information. And finally, we had clinical engagements where we discussed the SRTI with palliative care experts at end-of-life clinical groups, including Professor Biwi, the National Clinical Director for End-of-Life Care. As we promised, Mr Deputy Speaker, this would be a comprehensive review. And it was very clear from the findings of those discussions that there is a lack of consistency. A key theme that came up is, why is this not aligned with national palliative care initiatives? And that leads to duplication. So having spoken to GPs, they said to me, it's one of their worst roles they have to perform, where they have to explain to a patient that they will now be entering that terminal uh, illness phase and administering the palliative care. And in effect, that is done at 12 months. And in effect, if you wish to have a DS1500, to be clear, that isn't the only way to access SRTI, but it is probably the easiest way to access the SRTI. Then the GP has to have that same awful, tough conversation. That is neither good for the GPs, it's a duplication, and as part of the government's commitment uh, to create an additional 50 million GP appointments a year, that is an obvious example of something that should be reviewed and it is not good for the claimant, friends or family who are providing support. And we also discovered from the findings that there is mixed awareness of this support that is available. So we also uh, recognise that some people are not getting the support because they simply don't know that it is there to exist. And therefore, as I have previously uh, confirmed on the floor of the House uh, when asked by other MPs, we agree that there needs to be a change. Status quo isn't acceptable, and those three themes will address raising awareness, improving consistency, and changing the six months rule. Now, I understand the frustration of the delays, and I'm, as the Minister, very sorry that we haven't been able to bring those changes quicker. I wish, I dearly wish, I was in a position to have done that. But this is complex, and there are a number of issues. Firstly, 
as the Honourable Member for Newport East alluded to, COVID has caused issues. We needed that clinical evidence and engagement to make sure we were doing the appropriate changes. Because the reality is, if we propose something that doesn't work for the NHS, doesn't work for GPs and health professionals, this will, not, this will simply not work. And that is the challenge that the Scottish Government have got themselves into. They announced their changes long before us and whilst they still hope to legislate this year, they are far further away from being able to make changes than we are. Because in effect, they had very laudable hopes to allow anyone with a terminal illness to be able to access this fast track support. The problem is, from the day you are born, you are terminally ill. Now, we wouldn't accept that every, you know, the, a day one old baby should then get access to this. So they have to now apply conditions that limits access to those that they were intending to give it to, which is in danger of creating a far more complicated system that will not be welcomed by health professionals, clinicians, than the current status quo that we're all agreed to change. And I have spoken with the Scottish Government, I've urged them to look closely at the changes that we are proposing, and hopefully we can have a united, consistent approach across the whole of the UK. So COVID did cause delays on completing the review, and it has caused delays, as the reality is we will need legislation, because the changes we wish to do are extensive. They will require primary legislation, and it has to be lined up with DHSC, and I have to do that at a time that health professionals are tackling with COVID on the front bench. But I still remain absolutely determined that as quickly as possible, and I'll come more on to you yeah, very quickly. Given way, and I know the minister is sincere on this, but could the minister give us some idea of timescale on that? And would the minister meet with me and campaigners urgently to explain that in person? Yeah. So, and that's an absolutely fair challenge. And first of all, I regularly do meet with those groups, so I've kept them engaged throughout that process as I recognise how much that they invested in making sure that we made the right proposals to change and because of they understandably because of the importance and the seriousness of this issue are desperate for this to be brought forward something that i and my department share and we hope that we are in the coming months in a position to set out that timetable to start bringing forward those changes but for the bits that we don't have to legislate we have already done we always made that clear that during the review if there were things that we didn't need to legislate we would get on with that and we discovered that the information on gov.uk wasn't good enough. We have improved that. And that not all clinicians uh, were up to speed around the DS1500. So again, working with DHSC, we were able to, um, before COVID came, to make sure that the advice and guidance given to clinicians was increased. And we are working at pace to get that legislation lined up. It is crucial that we do it in a way that works with the NHS uh, and cross-government, and that is an absolute commitment. But we are determined to go further, because we have the talking to stakeholders. It is clear that uh, there are other areas that we can improve for those that might not be quite in the terminal illness uh, area, but the current system is not quick and simple enough. So in the forthcoming Health and Disability Green Paper, we will be exploring a number of themes which, uh, again, those groups will be proactively supporting our work to help change things. Firstly, around evidence. So the ability to access supportive evidence needs to be more consistent. It is, in some cases, a postcode lottery where there is clear supportive evidence that increases the chance of a paper-based review, a quicker, a simpler, more accurate outcome. We want to look at existing evidence on the principle, tell us once, and that's a cross-government thing, that those awful conversations ideally should only ever have to happen once and that is populated across all of the support and that then helps the claimant. And also looking at a broader range of evidence. So for example, would I need a GP to tell, some, tell me somebody has MND when if they're getting support from an MND nurse? You know, why would they be providing support unless they had MND? So that's a really simplistic example, but there are many other examples of the, uh, many of those charities and organisations provide 
palliative care and could we not give greater strength and credence to their supportive evidence. I also want to look at advocacy. The benefits system is complex at the best of times and as the Honourable Member for Newport East so, uh, was so articulate on that in those final moments you do not want to be navigating something that is complicated when every moment is so precious. So we want to look at how friends, family and advocates. So again, there's examples of the Macmillan nurses, the Sue Ryder nurses, the MND nurses. How can they be more involved in the application and securing of that support? And then also looking at the assessments themselves. We've seen during COVID that we've introduced telephone and video assessments. And in the Green Paper, we want to explore that principle. And this is the key bit that the stakeholders will be interested in, is looking at reducing unnecessary assessments. And again, as part of our commitment, to create a quicker and easier route where evidence is clear. And that's building on a principle we already have uh, on UC with the severe conditions criteria. And I think there's a lot of positive lessons to learn on that, that we can extend across the other benefits. And as I said, remove those unnecessary assessments. And then on a more broader level, through the national, the forthcoming national strategy for disabled people, I want to look and engage and consult on what more can be done across government because it's not just the DWP that people in this situation may need support and additional help and guidance. So I want to look at are there other areas where we can talk across government to improve the situation and also in the private sector. A good example is nationwide building society worked with Macmillan uh, to improve their training, understanding and guidance to support cancer um, patients uh, with any financial products provided by Nationwide. That is an exemplary example that I think we can then look to build on and share so that becomes a given, a more sympathetic, understanding, flexible approach to people in these situations. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, we are absolutely committed to bringing this forward as quickly as we can and we are working across government despite the COVID challenges, despite the, com uh, the complexity, but I am confident that we are getting close. We will look to raise awareness, we will look to improve awareness and we will change the six-month rule. I and the Secretary of State at DWP are absolutely committed. I am full of admiration for the work that the uh, Honourable Member for Newport East has done on this vital thing and all of those supportive groups and campaigners. We absolutely agree this is one of those rare issues that unites all political parties and all areas of devolved uh, assemblies. We're all agreed on this and we just need to find that way to deliver this complex but crucial legislation.